Good morning, Tribute! So, today we continue with the Tales of the Hunger Games. Be warned that literary gore and spoilers will follow. The 46th Games took place in a mushroom forest. They featured malicious goats, an earthquake, and lasted for nine days. This year's victor might have used a slightly controversial way to win the Games. However, due to an injury she sustained in the Games that affected her for years to come, the capital took no further action against her. This year's victor was Wyrus Plummer, aged 16 from District 3. When the gong went off, Wyrus deliberately waited on her podium, which left many viewers extremely confused. She later revealed that she wanted to see what other tributes would do first, before deciding whether she should attempt to grab something from the cornucopia. Although there were plenty of killings simultaneously occurring in front of her, Wyrus spied a loaf of bread and a water bottle that had not yet been approached and were not yet within the current eyesight of any armed tribute. She rushed for this bread and water and grabbed them, before fleeing in the opposite direction from the other fleeing tributes. After spending most of the first day gaining distance from the career pack, Wyrus was exhausted and spent that night sleeping up a tree that was close to the arena's perimeter. The next day, she carefully explored some of the surrounding area, and in the light of day she noticed that there were mushrooms covering the ground within 20 metres of the perimeter. Despite being tempted to eat something apart from bread, Wyrus had never encountered these mushrooms before, and therefore did not trust eating them, fearing that they could be poisonous. As the first few days went by, Wyrus continued travelling adjacently to the perimeter, in order to be as far away from potential action as possible. However, on the fourth day, while she was taking a nap in a tree, she was awoken by screaming that was moving closer and closer. Wyrus looked around to see Dason and Bella, both from five, running from what appeared to be a very perturbed goat. However, to Wyrus' surprise, the goat stopped just before the ground where the mushrooms started to grow. Dason and Bella collapsed in exhaustion and relief before noticing these mushrooms. Dason asked Bella if they had any food left, but when she replied that they did not, he took a mushroom and ate it whole. Bella, who had seemed a bit sceptical, lost all suspicion she had when Dason told her how nice the mushroom tasted, before he plucked another from the ground. Little did the pair know that Wyrus was carefully observing them, whilst Bella nibbled her first mushroom and Dason wolfed down his third. They carried on eating them and commented on how tasty they were. At this point, Wyrus guessed that the mushrooms were in fact safe to eat, and even considered asking for an alliance with Dason and Bella. However, just as Wyrus was about to let her presence be known, Dason started giggling, at first quietly, but then very quickly cackling so loudly that Bella tried to silence him. However, as Bella walked towards Dason, she started walking at a strange angle, and within a matter of seconds, she was also laughing uncontrollably, but unlike Dason, she had collapsed onto the ground. Dason grinned inanely, then walked in a euphoric trance straight past Bella and past Wyrus' tree. He put his hands out as he approached the perimeter and calmly repeated the word shimmer as he neared the perimeter. Wyrus cringed because she knew what was about to happen and the second that Dason put his hands against the perimeter he was flung backwards with his head cracking against a tree. Even the sound made Wyrus wince and within seconds his cannon had sounded. Bella, who had still been cackling in a heap on the floor, gradually slowed her laughter and then inquisitively called for Dason apparently not realising that he had just died. As she got up, she noticed Dason's inanimate body and let out a shrill scream at the sight of his mangled skull, whilst a hovercraft appeared in the sky in order to take the corpse. Bella started clawing at the sky in a futile effort to attack the hovercraft. Wyrus considered rushing to Dason's body before the hovercraft took it, in order to see if he had anything useful on him, but with the hovercraft above them, she realised that other tributes might soon arrive in order to fight whoever causes his death. Wyrus, who now had hardly any water in her possession, saw that Bella still had a water bottle in her pocket, and realised that she needed to get this bottle before the other tributes, who were probably rushing to their destination at that moment, would arrive. Without wasting a moment, Wyrus climbed down the tree and approached Bella, who was now screaming at the goat and shouting at it to stop flying. Wyrus quickly tackled Bella to the ground and grabbed her water bottle. Although Bella was now shrieking and twisting, Wyrus noticed some copper wire sticking out of one of her other pockets as well, and so she grabbed it and ran as quickly as she could. Within seconds of Wyrus escaping, the, the career pack arrived and witnessed Bella now scratching her own face and shouting at something in her head to get out. Vulcan, from 2, 
put Bella out of her misery and stabbed her through the head, killing her instantly. After disposing of Bella, the careers killed the nearby goat before cutting open its flesh and then cooking it on a makeshift fire. As they ate, Wyrus took a few of the poisonous mushrooms and carefully listened to their conversation, learning that they knew that these mushrooms were deadly. As the pack headed back to the cornucopia whilst killing any goats in their way, Wyrus very carefully followed them, being careful not to make any noise that could alert them to her presence. As Wyrus followed them over the next few days, she learned more about the group's dynamic and realised that they were a lot less united than past career packs, often moaning about the lack of bottled water and blaming each other when they couldn't find things. On the sixth night, whilst Palisander and Ebony, both from one, were canoodling behind a nearby tree, and Vulcan and Florentina, both from two, were distracted by what they thought were approaching goats, Wyrus grabbed the remaining water bottles that had been dumped a few metres away from their base. When Palisander and Ebony returned and the former asked for some water, an argument broke out when they all realised that there was none left, which ultimately resulted in Vulcan stabbing Palisander and Florentina snapping Ebony's neck. Wyrus spent that night sleeping in a well-covered tree nearby, and when Florentina and Vulcan started travelling the next day, she stealthily followed them. She kept her distance whilst they were cooking soup to eat for an afternoon meal, but whilst Florentina was chopping up some of the goat meat, Ebenezer from Nine accidentally stumbled into the clearing where they were resting, which led to Vulcan and Florentina chasing him and killing him. However, whilst Ebenezer was being chased and the soup was left unattended, Wyrus seized her opportunity and put the majority of the poisonous mushroom pieces into the cooking pot then ran back out of the clearing with just seconds to spare before Florentina and Vulcan returned. Neither Vulcan nor Florentina tasted anything suspicious as they ate the soup, and within approximately ten minutes of them starting to eat, Vulcan was looking at the sky in amazement, whilst Florentina was staring in a confused manner at the ground and claiming that she had three hands. Wyrus then revealed herself and grabbed Florentina's axe. However, by the time she had picked it up and was about to stab Florentina, Vulcan had just about managed to get his arrows ready to shoot Wyrus. As he shot her in the back, she yelped out in pain and ran away with the axe. Then just as she was deserting the clearing, Vulcan giggled and shot another arrow through Florentina's eye, killing her almost instantly. It was only later, when he had returned to normal after waking up, that he realised what had happened. Once the next morning dawned, there were just four tributes left, so Wyrus decided to head back to the perimeter in order to be away from the remaining competition. While she was there, she speculated about how she could potentially use the force field in the perimeter to her advantage. Later in the day, after a goat skewered dandelion from Eleven with its horns, and there were now just three tributes remaining, a continuous earthquake rippled out from the cornucopia, sending Vulcan and Minnesota from Six running to the perimeter, where the ground was a lot more stable. Although Minnesota was crushed to death by a falling tree, Vulcan made it to the perimeter and started circulating, looking for Wyrus. As she heard him approaching, she realised that there was no way that she would win a fight against him, even though he had arrows and she had an axe. She panicked. However, as his taunting got closer, she formulated a plan to kill him. Wyrus wedged some of the coil between a stick and the perimeter, so that it would still touch the perimeter. She then led the coil towards the axe and wrapped the coil around the axe's handle. She also covered the trail from the perimeter to the axe in leaves so that Vulcan wouldn't notice this trap. Wyrus then lay down a few metres from the perimeter, so that it looked like she had just been knocked unconscious after running into the force field. As Vulcan approached her and laughed, Wyrus kept her eyes closed, silently wishing that he would try to kill her by using the axe instead of the arrows. A few tense moments went by before Vulcan grabbed the axe, which as Wyrus has planned, gave him a deep electric shock through the current from the force field, and made him roar out in pain as he collapsed to the ground. However, as Vulcan fell, he dropped the shaft of the axe onto Wyrus' head, which gave her an equally painful electric shock. But although Wyrus was knocked unconscious for real this time, Vulcan's shock had been stronger, and he died just seconds later. The game makers rushed to retrieve Wyrus, who was now lying unconscious right next to the force field and holding on to life. This became the only year in which the hovercraft crew had to leave the craft and enter the arena in order to retrieve the victor. Seeing as they didn't want to accidentally swing her unconscious body into the perimeter, which would be highly likely to kill her. They managed to get her back to the craft and after several tense hours, Wyrus was resuscitated. Although it soon became clear that she had undergone a certain degree of brain damage from the electric shock that she had received in the arena. 
The Victor's interview this year was a disaster, with Festus Creed trying to ask Wyrus questions about her time in the arena, before it soon became clear that she was mentally unstable, while she quietly sang a song about an egg named Humpty Dumpty, and lightly giggled whenever Festus mentioned the force field. Wyrus went on to live a relatively peaceful life in District 3, before dying in the 75th Hunger Games. The 47th Games took place in Hot Springs. They featured flesh-eating moles, a period of pitch black, and lasted for five days. This year's victor was considered to be very deserving of the title, after surviving a record number of murder attempts whilst in the arena. This year's victor was Brutus Gunn, aged 18, from District 2. Like most years, the career pack grouped together during the bloodbath and killed as many tributes as they could. Brutus, who had already been unafraid to show his strength to other tributes throughout training, killed five of the ten tributes that died within the first five minutes. Furthermore, as Brutus was stabbing Azure from eight, Azure managed to stab Brutus in the ribs with a small knife, which Brutus did not even notice had pierced his flesh until some time had passed and the remaining tributes had either died or fled from the cornucopia clearing. He casually took out the knife and added it to his collection before sitting down for a rest. The career pack spent the first day roaming around the arena and killing any tributes that they encountered. However, whilst resting that night, Brutus was shot with an arrow in the arm by Basil from 12. The other careers got their weapons ready to attack Basil, but as he fled, Brutus ran after him and easily caught up with him, before grabbing his neck and throwing him off the side of a nearby cliff. As he walked back to the career's pace, he nonchalantly asked what food they had left. The next day, whilst exploring one of the forests, Brutus was attacked by Callista from Seven, who jumped down from a tree onto his back, whilst holding one of the moles in her hand and trying to get the mole to bite Brutus's neck. However, Brutus casually reached backwards and grabbed Callista by her ponytail, then used it to pull her to the floor. Whilst kneeling on her throat, Brutus took the mole from her hand and forced it into her mouth, before it appeared to travel down her throat. Brutus held his hand against Callista's mouth, so that she couldn't even scream. After a minute, he left her convulsing on the floor while she was being eaten from the inside out by the mole. This death was thought to be one of the most iconic in the history of the games and made Brutus a capital favourite. Just as Callista's cannon sounded a few minutes later, he was awarded with some armour from sponsors. On the third day, the careers continued to roam the arena, but only found and killed Antoinette from 10. However, with just eight tributes remaining by the morning of the fourth day, the light within the arena started to disappear, taking just 60 seconds to completely vanish and leave the arena in complete darkness. As soon as it was pitch black, Brutus heard the sword of Gaia from 2 swiping at the air just inches from his face, so he ducked and grabbed his spear before jamming it through her stomach. Brutus also heard someone running straight towards him and held another spear in the path of Thief's footsteps that he could hear. Within seconds, he heard a female scream of pain that he could tell belonged to Agate from 1. Brutus stayed as quiet as possible as he moved from his original position, hoping that Malachite, from one, would not be able to locate him. However, when the light returned just five minutes later, Malachite had run away and was nowhere to be seen. Brutus decided to head to the cornucopia clearing in order to find new targets, but as he started walking through the forest, a knife came flying straight at his heart. Although he managed to dodge the knife, it hit his shoulder, hurting him intensely and bringing him to the ground. Malachite appeared and it then became apparent that it was he who had thrown this knife. He walked over to Brutus and stepped onto the knife, which caused Brutus to shout out in pain. Malachite raised an axe into the air and brought it down towards Brutus's head. However, just a fraction of a second before the axe would have hit Brutus, he rolled to the side and the axe became lodged in the ground. As Malachite desperately tried to free the axe from the ground, Brutus threw a knife straight at Malachite's left eye. Once it had been hit and Malachite was screaming in pain, Brutus threw the other knife at his other eye, leaving Malachite to scream even louder as the knives moved around with the movements of Malachite's eyes. Brutus carefully removed the knife from his shoulder and walked back to the cornucopia whilst Malachite begged for anyone to help him. By the next day, Brutus knew that he only had three opponents left. Whilst down by the largest spring that was next to the cornucopia clearing, he noticed that some wires had been camouflaged into the rocks. Although he was still suspicious, he carefully followed them until he felt a sharp pain run through his body and realised that he had just been electrocuted. Unbeknownst to Brutus, Franklin and Ruta, both from 3, had set a trap with the wires that would electrocute anyone who stepped into a certain area that Brutus had indeed just entered. However, amazingly, this electric shock did not seem to really affect Brutus. 
despite the fact that electric currents which were less powerful than this had severely injured and even killed tributes in past games. Franklin and Ruta gasped at the failure of their plan from behind a nearby rock which gave away their position. Within a minute, Brutus had the pair of them by the scruffs of their necks, whilst they begged for mercy. However, Brutus was not willing to show any mercy whatsoever, and lowered their screaming heads into the boiling spring, which killed them both within 30 seconds. Brutus knew that Virginia, from six, was his only remaining opponent, so he shouted at her to come and get him. He started circling the spring, as he guessed that she had camouflaged herself within the vicinity. Once Brutus reached the other side of the spring, Virginia, who had actually been hiding in the nearby woods, jumped onto his back and started gouging his eyes. Although Virginia at first seemed to have a slight chance of victory, Brutus realised how he could kill her most easily and let himself fall backwards. As Virginia had been on Brutus's back, she was crushed once they hit the floor, and this literally knocked the air out of her lungs. She tried to free herself but her efforts were in vain, and her internal organs were slowly crushed to death before her cannon eventually sounded and Brutus was declared the winner. After the games, Brutus became known as Brutus the Indestructible. He returned to District 2 and took up a position in the training academy, specialising in weapons combat. The 48th games took place in mining caves. They featured blood-sucking bats, a tsunami and lasted for 12 days. Although this year's games were criticised for having an overly large arena which caused a lack of action between tributes, they were still praised for the overall design of the arena which led to many memorable moments throughout the games. This year's victor was Blight Jordan, aged 18, from District 7. During the countdown, Blight looked around the central cave and realised that this year the only weapons were small mining chisels. He scanned the rest of the supplies and also noticed that there were small parchments of paper with quills attached to them. Blight had watched enough games in the past to know that if there was something unusual in the cornucopia, it was probably worth taking. So when the gong sounded, Blight strategically ran past the attacking career tributes and grabbed a chisel. He then turned back and grabbed a parchment and quill before fleeing through the nearest tunnel. However, as he ran through the tunnel, he saw June from 12 not far ahead of him. Being gifted with an axe, he was quickly able to adjust to using a chisel and threw it into the back of June's head, immediately killing her. Blight saw that she had managed to grab a backpack, so he took it and made his way through the complicated labyrinth of mazes until he reached the perimeter before setting a base there. However, just as Blight was about to fall asleep that night, he looked up at the cave wall to his left and saw that to his surprise and horror, a pair of eyes in the wall looking straight back at him. As Blight jumped up from his blanket, Nancy from Six emerged from the wall, covered in rocky powder that she had used to camouflage herself. She held up her hands to show that she had no weapons on her, and begged Blight not to kill her. Blight considered her offer for a while, and seeing as she could not have been much older than twelve and seemed harmless, he accepted her request. The pair took turns keeping watch and sleeping, rising early the next morning to explore the rest of the arena, whilst taking turns with who would go first round each corner. The pair made a decent alliance and looked out for each other, although they failed to encounter any other tributes. However, late on the third day, Nancy tripped and cut her arm on a rock, which caused her to bleed slightly. Blight turned a corner and was met by a vicious colony of bats flying towards them. The pair ran for their lives in the direction that they had just come, but the bats only seemed to be interested in Nancy, who was subsequently bitten by the bats. As Blight ran, he looked back and could not see Nancy through the bats that were now covering her entire body. Once he managed to run out of harm's way, he stopped and realised that he no longer had his backpack or any other supplies, except for the quill and parchment that he had kept in his pocket. Once Blight finally came to a stop and collapsed in a wave of exhaustion, he realised to his horror that he had no recollection of the tunnel that he was in, and he was subsequently overrun with a wave of disorientation, confusion and panic a feeling that was often experienced by a variety of tributes throughout this year's games. He panicked for several minutes until he noticed that something was very quickly sliding towards him across the wires on the side of the tunnel. He got up and started to run until he noticed that this object was slowing down as it neared him. Once it caught up to Blight, it came to a standstill and he realised that it was a sponsor gift. As he started to feel dehydrated, he hoped this would be water. But when he opened it, he was most annoyed to find that it was a dark black liquid, which seemed very unsuitable for drinking. 
Although he thought that this was an annoying joke and he proceeded to vent his anger onto the nearest rock, he soon realised that it was in fact ink for the quill that he could use on the parchment. However, this also made him wonder what the other tributes were using instead of ink. Despite still being annoyed at not receiving water, Blight spent the next few days making a map of the surrounding tunnels, whilst desperately hoping to find a tunnel that would lead him to a source of water. When he awoke the next morning, he felt dizzy and dazed with extreme thirst, however he could hear the ghastly screeches of the bats nearby. He gave them a few minutes in order to finish off whoever their victim was, but once he heard that they had died down, he followed the tunnel from where he had heard them and saw the pale white body of Proxy from Three, which had been sucked dry of all its blood. As Blight saw a body claw slide down the wires of the cave towards Proxy's body, he staggered as quickly as he could towards the body in order to see if there was anything useful in Proxy's pockets. He reached Proxy very shortly before the body claw and was somewhat pleased to find some bread in Proxy's pocket. He also searched for water, but just as the light on the body claw turned red, he noticed that there was also some parchment which he grabbed before fleeing from the body claw whilst it took Proxy's body away and whizzed away down the tunnel to the nearest hole in the cave's ceiling. Once Blight had eaten some of the bread, he checked the parchment and was horrified to see that although Proxy had made a very detailed map, it was written in a red liquid, which Blight identified as blood. He also seemed to still be filling it in right up to his death. However, there was also a route that led to what appeared to be a lake. Without hesitating, Blight followed the tunnels on the map and indeed came across the lake from which he drank for a long enough time to rehydrate himself. Whilst he was resting, he realised that the bats must have killed Proxy because they could smell his blood on the paper when he was near enough to them, and this also made sense with how they had attacked Nancy when she was bleeding. By the tenth day, there were still eight tributes left, after five more had died from dehydration and the bats. At this point, the tributes were all very far apart, and so the game makers announced that a wave of water would be released from the perimeter within five minutes which prompted most tributes to run as quickly as they could towards the cornucopia. Blight considered running back to the cornucopia, but also realised that there would most likely be another bloodbath. As calmly as he could, he considered how he could avoid going to the cornucopia without drowning, and with a minute to spare before the wave was due to leave the perimeter, he realised that he might stand a chance if he could attach himself onto the roof of the cave. Luckily for Blight, he was from District 7, where residents learned from a young age how to climb and hold onto trees by using their legs. Just as he heard the waves starting to travel through the tunnel, he gripped his arms and legs onto one of the ruts of the cave's roof. As the wave approached, Blight observed that it was almost filling the entire tunnel of water, but there was indeed a small bit at the top of the tunnel that was not submerged beneath the water. As the wave passed underneath him, he found it difficult to hold on and at one point his head was just one inch from the water which would have likely swept him away to his death if he had lowered himself any further. However, as the minutes passed, the wave slowed down and Blight heard the sound of four of the remaining eight cannons. After a while, the wave's height had lowered greatly and seemed to be returning to the perimeter, which allowed Blight to safely dismount from the roof of the cave and wade through the water back to the cornucopia. During the next day, Arius from two was impaled with a spear by Dixie from eleven, which left just Blight, Dixie and Ferra from one alive by the start of the twelfth day. As Blight awoke on this final day, he looked down the tunnel towards the perimeter and saw the growing silhouette of the bats flying towards him. He ran as quickly as he could towards the cornucopia and despite taking a few wrong turns, made it back without being injured by the bats. However, Ferra was not so lucky and after grazing her leg when accidentally scraping past the tunnel's wall, the bats smelt her wound and sucked the blood from her leg which killed her within a few minutes. As Blight re-entered the cornucopia cave, he was immediately tackled to the ground by Dixie as she jumped down from above a tunnel entrance. This caused Blight to drop his chisel, and Dixie mounted him so that it was easier for her to strangle him. However, as she was strangling him, he managed to get her hand free and pulled on her hair, eventually managing to smash her head down into the ground. As Dixie tried to get back up, Blight wriggled free and grabbed his chisel which he subsequently smashed straight through Dixie's head, killing her instantly and leaving him victorious. After achieving victory, Blight returned to District 7, where he opened a new timber company. However, he suffered recurring nightmares from the trauma that he had faced within the arena and became addicted to alcohol for many years after his games. The 49th games took place in grassy orchards. They featured angry bees, a toxic air release, and lasted for eight days. 
This year's games once again proved that anything in the arena could be used to a tribute's advantage. This year's victor was James Logan, age 16, from District 5. Upon hearing the gong, James ran and grabbed a water bottle and a sleeping bag, but as he was fleeing from the clearing, he ran past the body of his district partner, Clojure, and he noticed that a knife was sticking out of her head. Realising that this might be his only chance to get a weapon, James pulled the knife from Clojure's head, but was very nearly hit with a knife by Rex from 2. However, he managed to duck and then ran away before anyone else had the chance to kill him. Jane spent the first two days travelling to the perimeter and then hiding in undergrowth in order to avoid the career tributes, who he soon realised were revelling in a literal killing spree, often boasting to each other about which horrific method they would use to kill their next victim. After growing hungry, James used his knife to peel fruit from the orchards. However, he noticed that when he discarded the fruit peel onto the ground, it would often attract the bees. Being from District 5, James was proficient with using wire and took some of the wire from the orchard's fences, which he attached around various sticks from the nearby trees, in order to make a small box. He placed some of the peel in this box, and as predicted, more bees flew into the box, which allowed him to trap them there. Just as he was quietly rejoicing in the fact that he had managed to trap these bees and potentially use them to his advantage, a sponsor gift flew down to him. However, when James opened the bag containing the sponsor gift, which had the traditional logo of the capital on the side, he was dismayed and confused to find it empty. As he considered why this had happened, he realised that this was obviously not a mistake, but must have been empty for a reason. James later told how it was at this point that he remembered his mentor, Samuel von Altegott, advising him to use any natural resources that were offered within the arena. James looked at the bag and realised that any tribute would be glad to see this bag and would rush to open it, possibly without even knowing that it had a bunch of rather irate bees inside it. James kept the other wire box that he had made, which contained the bees that he could still hear buzzing away inside. However, he put some more of the fruit peel into the sponsor bag, which trapped more bees, before he closed it tightly shut so that they could not escape. James then moved back towards the centre of the arena, where he knew that there would be more tributes. Later that day, as James saw Battery from 3 and Agnes from 12 approaching from across one of the fields, he shook the sponsor bag, which angered the bees inside, before running behind a nearby bush so that he could keep watch. When Battery spotted the bag, he rushed to open it without giving it a second thought. However, when he saw the bees angrily swarming, he ran for his life, and although he outran the bees, Agnes was not so lucky, and was stung all over her body, before dying a few minutes later. As soon as Agnes's cannon went off and the bees buzzed off elsewhere, James ran over to her body and took a water bottle that she had in her jacket, before he grabbed the empty sponsor bag and walked off in the opposite direction. For the next few days, James continued using the strategy involving fruit peel, the bees and the sponsor bag, which helped him to eliminate seven more tributes by the end of the seventh day, leaving just eight tributes alive. However, as he wakened on the eighth day, it was announced that toxic air would start being released into the arena in one hour, and that the only way to avoid suffocation would be to use a mask from the cornucopia. When James reached the outside of the cornucopia clearing, he was ready to take a mask, but he did not want to be targeted by other tributes, who he correctly guessed were waiting at the edge of the clearing and ready to pounce on whoever approached the mask first. James checked that his wired box of bees were ready to be released, but just as he was checking, Nicole and Stumpy, both from Seven, ran towards the centre of the clearing, which saw them both covered in a shower of arrows from the careers, who revealed themselves to be on the other side of the arena. Although Stumpy collapsed, Nicole somehow managed to grab a mask and escape, albeit with two arrows in her arm, which led to the careers running to grab a mask and then chasing after Nicole. Although Nicole almost outran the career pack, she was eventually hunted down and killed, which very quickly led to the careers turning on each other and engaging in an epic fight that lasted for a few minutes, but saw only Rex escape alive, before he returned to the cornucopia in order to kill James, who was now his only remaining opponent. Once Rex had James in sight, he thought that he would easily win and threw his spear at him, but James ducked once again, and just as Rex was getting his bow and arrow ready, James threw the wire box of bees at Rex, which crashed to the ground and opened at his feet, releasing a swarm of angry bees that killed Rex extremely quickly and left James as the victor. After achieving victory, James spent a lot of time in the capital. Whilst initially he did not seem overly affected by what he had experienced in the arena, he proved to be popular amongst capital circles and attended many parties, which left him with a crippling addiction to alcohol until he died later in the 75th Hunger Games.
The 50th Hunger Games were the hotly anticipated second quarter quell, and in order to mark this important anniversary, the games were preceded by a week of lavish celebrations that involved some of the most popular victors of the last 50 years. The 45 living victors all chose to travel to the capital for this momentous week of celebration, where they all gave interviews and revealed unknown facts about their games, whilst also talking about how being a victor had brought pride and prosperity to not just them and their families, but to their districts as well. For this year's games, twice the normal number of tributes were reaped to participate in the games, which meant that there were four tributes from each district, with a total of 48. For this special series of reapings, it was decided that past victors would host and pick the tributes at random from the glass bowls of each district. Due to the unfortunate disappearance of District 12's only victor, Lucy Greybeard, President Snow was due to lead this reaping, seeing as he had in fact been her mentor and had even once served there as a peacekeeper. However, due to a security threat from District 12, Snow did not travel to the district, and so the district's mayor conducted the reaping in his place. It is also worth noting that several children of past victors were reaped this year, including Severus Galloway from 2, Magneta Didsbury from 6, Tweed Berwick from 8, and Walter and Lucia Farnham, both from 10. As a rare treat for the capital, Septimus Paddock allowed cameras into the training centre for the first time ever, which gave citizens a better look at these tributes in action and helped them to determine the tribute's chances of victories as well. Citizens of the capital were also allowed to fight in virtual arenas that were designed by Flavia Nixon and Cobalt Townsend. These virtual fights proved to be extremely popular and saw the birth of what became known as game tourism, where still to this day citizens of the capital are able to visit past arenas, reenact memorable murders and explore to their heart's desire. In another special change to tradition, the tribute's interviews were preceded by the Victor Extravaganza Variety Show, in order to really get capital spectators into the mood. It started with a fashion parade that allowed many victors to show off some of their district's best couture, and there was a variety of amusing acts throughout the evening, but the show was ultimately stolen by Bluebell Jansen, who performed a comedically choreographed song about her games, with various other victors dancing with her and playing the part of her opponents, while she pretended to strangle them with her arms and legs. The Tributes interviews then went relatively normally, and lots of discussions with Tributes focused on how the games would be different with twice the amount of Tributes competing. This year's games took place in a poisonous paradise. Amongst many animals, it featured skewering birds, a volcanic eruption, and lasted for 24 days. For most Tributes, the arena was the most beautiful place that they had ever seen. Unlike past arenas, the central cornucopia clearing stretched for miles. In the distance, a forest could be seen on one side and a mountain on the other side. This year's victor was Hamish Abernathy, aged 16, from District 12. With double the amount of normal tributes, it was inevitable that more tributes would die than in a normal year, with a total of 18 out of the 48 tributes dying in the first five minutes. Amidst the violent chaos, Hamish managed to grab a knife and a loaf of bread before escaping and running off towards the forest. Over the next week, Hamish explored the forest and bordering fields. However, on the third day, whilst following Edna and Sifa, both from Nine, he saw them eat fruit from a tree before they vomited and died within a few minutes. The next day, he walked up behind Hermione from Five, who was drinking water from a stream, and she too died within minutes. Even after sniffing one of the flowers, Hamish started to feel faint, and like many other tributes this year, it came to his attention that although this was one of the most picturesque arenas that he had ever seen, it was also one of the deadliest. Hamish remained safe by rationing the loaf of bread, whilst drinking the water from the occasional rainstorms that occurred. However, on the eighth day, he encountered a pack of career boys. He put up a valiant fight, and managed to slay Icarus and Severus, both from two, but eventually Jasper from one, grabbed Hamish by the hair and was ready to kill him. However, just as Jasper was about to slit Hamish's throat, he was hit in the neck and collapsed to the ground, much to Hamish's confusion. Macely, from 12, revealed herself to have been hiding behind a nearby tree and to have shot Jasper in the neck with a poison dart. Realising that they were better working together, Hamish suggested that they allied, which Macely was happy to accept. Over the next week, they travelled through the arena and to the perimeter, whilst they shared food and took turns keeping watch and sleeping. During this week, the snow-capped mountain on the other side of the arena erupted molten lava, which spewed down its sides and killed 12 more tributes, including most of the career pack, 
which left just 13 tributes alive by day 18. Over the next four days, eight more tributes were killed, with many of these being at the hands of Opal from one, and on day 22, Hamich and Maisily finally arrived at the perimeter, although Hamich was disappointed that there was nothing that he deemed to be useful in helping them against other tributes. Maisily said to Hamich that she wanted to head back to the cornucopia, but when Hamich told her that he wanted to stay, Maisily broke off their alliance, stating that with only three opponents remaining, she did not want the final fight to be between them. After Maisily left, Hamich spent the next few minutes staring out beyond the perimeter, but as he turned around, he accidentally kicked a pebble off the hill, which to his great surprise, bounced back up from the force field. He then threw a larger rock off the hill, which once again bounced back up. However, just as Hamich caught the second rock, he heard Maisily scream. He rushed in the direction of the scream and saw that she had just been attacked by pink fluffy birds, who were still trying to bite her with their skewering beaks. Hamich ran to Maisily, which scared away the birds, but it was too late to save her, and as she died, he held her hand. After Pike, from four, was stabbed by Opal, and Tweed, from eight, was savagely bitten to death by carnivorous squirrels, Opal was redirected by game makers to the perimeter where Hamich was still resting. The pair engaged in an extremely violent fight, and each of them managed to stab the others several times, with Opal almost disemboweling Hamich, and Hamich slicing out Opal's left eye. Eventually, Hamich very nearly passed out, and stumbled up the hill, away from Opal and towards the perimeter. However, as Hamich collapsed next to the edge of the hill, Opal threw her axe, which went hurtling past where Hamich had just been kneeling. Opal considered how else she could kill Hamich, but to her shock, the axe bounced back from the perimeter's force field and hit her in the face, killing her instantly and leaving Hamich as the victor. The capital was not happy with Hamich's actions, seeing his use of the arena's force field as a way of mocking them. Although a similar strategy had been used four years earlier by Wyrus Plummer, she was left with a severe long-term injury, which had not happened to Hamich. Therefore, the capital killed Hamich's mother, brother, and girlfriend. Due to this, Hamich developed a heavy alcohol addiction, but ultimately masterminded the rebellion in 76, before being captured and killed in the reclamation of 88.